Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. Today is World War Two Day, so of course I'm incredibly happy. Alex, who have we got on? Yeah, you sound very happy. I am very happy. Should I go <laughs> higher pitched? Is that more happy? <laughs> Yeah, slightly more convincing. Uh, yeah, we, do you know what? We've got a bit of a secret historian today because this lady lurks. She lurks everywhere, learning <laughs> and taking things in and getting ready to write books. But she doesn't necessarily scream about how awesome she is. So we forced her to come on and talk about one of her specialist subjects. So Merrin Waters, hello. Hello. What a lovely introduction. I know. You, you lurk. You're a lurker. I'm a lurker. Yeah. Like a, not like a creepy stalker in the shadows, kind of. Not at all. Not no, at all. sinister <laughs> lurker. Um, but you're there, assembling knowledge and uh, doing stuff. And you're going to talk to us about the battle for Ortona today, aren't you? Yes, I am. Ortona in Italy. Yeah. So this is really good. So we just got back from Italy. Um, and any excuse for us to go back and look at stuff again is greatly appreciated because that was fun. Yeah. Although I do feel like now I crave Prosecco at all hours of the day and night. I don't know about you. Yeah. I'm right. going abroad anywhere. I, just, I, just, I, I, I happily cross the border into the Czech Republic right now just to get out of Poland. Right. So, as soon Go as on. they lift the, lift the, the no fly zone, we'll all be off. Yes, but definitely. Ortona. Let's stick with Ortona and stop complaining mm-hmm. about COVID, although I feel like we it's deserve to. It's nearly, it's nearly Christmas and it's nearly over. There's a vaccine. Anyway, set the scene for us. What was the situation in Europe in late 1943? Okay. Um, Europe, disregarding what's going on in other theatres of war at, at, at this time in, in Europe and in Italy in particular, it's all getting a bit silly. Italy's been cooperating with the Germans for some time. The Italian Expeditionary Corps, they've helped take the Ukraine. The Royal U- Italian Army's been to Russia. And it's a fascist state. It's been taking orders. Orders are orders under Mussolini. But everybody knows the writings on the wall. Mussolini's psychologically, physically shattered by some successive Italian defeats they've been involved in. He's so depressed, he's catatonic, he's high on drugs, as is Hitler. The writing on the wall, though, is clear that things are not going well. By September, Sicily is the focus for the Allies. What we've done is we've sent probably about half a million British, Indian, French, New Zealanders, Americans, and most importantly today, the Canadians, down to Sicily, they've crossed to the mainland, over to mainland Italy, bottom of the, the boot of Italy, in the first week of September, 3rd to 9th of September. And the plan is to work their way up the mainland of Italy and push the Germans back. The, the, the trouble, the real trouble here is that for the Italians, you know the David Mitchell meme, the one where he's, he's dressed in a German uniform and he goes, we're the baddies? <laughs> well, yeah. on, on the on the eighth of September, there's an armistice, which means that the guys who are fighting, the Italians who are fighting on the Wednesday, they're fighting with the Germans. They wake up on the Thursdays and they go, "We're not the baddies anymore." Okay, and they've got to fight with the Allies. But, but, but that's almost a whole other story. The point is that in Europe, Italy, late 1943, it's all about drawing attention away from the north of Europe. That's where we are. So what was the Battle of Ortona? Where did it pl- take place and when? Okay. So the Battle for Ortona is the battle to recapture a port town. Ortona sits on the eastern coast of Italy, about halfway up, and it takes place between the 20th of December and about the 27th, 28th of December, so just after Boxing Day. So why is Ortona so important to the Allies and the Axis at this point? Okay, well... Italy in general, politically, the Allies need to break through the lines of defence that the Germans have set up. They need to get into Rome, retake Rome fully, get some law and order going, break through those defensive lines and push the Germans' backs, really get their backs to the wall. From a military perspective, as I said, it's all about pulling the attention away from northern France. What they'd like to do, what the Allies really want to achieve, is they want to tie down about 20 divisions worth of German fighting forces Um, So that come June 1944, the planning is already underway for D-Day, the the fighting forces are depleted. Ortona specifically is on a coastal highway. It's, um, if you imagine Milton Keynes with horizontal and vertical roads, Ortona's set out very much the same way. It's a port town, it's a medieval town, it sits up on the clifftop, but crucially, 
Highway 16 going out of the north of the town comes onto a 90 degree angle with the Pescara Rome Highway and Rome is where we want to be. So from, from the Allies perspective, Ortona represents a few things. It's become the focal point for Montgomery's plans to give the troops a break over the winter. Italian winters are notoriously bitterly cold. There's a real knife edge to weather fronts that's going to debilitate the troops on both sides. And Ortona's also become a point of pride for Hitler. He's a shattered man. He knows his time has come, not just here in the Med, but everywhere. And yet he's still, he's decided to dig in and hang on as much as he can. And he's been digging in quite literally into Italy for a year. Organisation Tot has been setting up, um, it's an engineering organisation predominantly, has been setting up defensive lines for the German troops um, right the way across across mainland Italy. You've got the Barbara line, the Berhardt line, the Hitler line, and the Gustav line. Ortona sits on the on the east coast at one end of the Gustav line. That's supposed to be the strongest. Um, it's, if, you, if we think of Italy as a boot and the Gothic line is the garter at a thigh high level, then the winter line, this collection of lines going across Italy is like a crumpled sock sitting just below your knee. It's far enough down so that um, it, so the Germans still see Italy as a springboard for the Balkans and the resources there, the oil and the copper. It's far enough up, the winter line is far enough up so that if the Allies can cut through there, they've really got a hold on things. What the Germans don't know is that, that D-Day is already in the planning stages. What they don't realise really is that this is all about smoke and mirrors and drawing the, the focus away, reducing the strength of the German army down here. And the, the, the guy in charge there, Albert Kesselring, he's, he's on board with Hitler at the moment still, and he still wants to keep up this long-distance war if he can. He doesn't want the Allies to start leapfrogging from airfield to airfield. He wants to keep the troops dug in and hang on as much as possible. I can't believe how easy to understand you make all of this. Really? Yeah. Okay. Seriously, because I'm like, Italy, World War II, boom, don't understand that shit show. <laughs> well, we'll keep going, we'll keep going. I'm going to get into regiments in a minute, so it could all go pear shape. Brilliant, okay, let's do that. Who is fighting? You've already mentioned Canada, haven't you? Yes. Here in Ortona, it's all about the Canadians and the Germans, with a minor reservation, because there are some Indian troops, um, Allied Indian troops on, on the west flank. From the German perspective, we've got two battalions of the elite First Fallschirmjäger, Regiments 3 and 4, they're entrenched in the town in defensive positions. And, and I, I should perhaps mention that this town, it's a medieval town. It's not, um, the, the, the houses aren't far apart. It's, they're falling over each other. It's about a thousand yards from north to south and about 400 yards from west to east. And in normal peace times, I suppose there are about nine and a half thousand people there. But we've got two battalions of um, Fallschirmjäger sat up in the town. Just to the south and west, we've got the 1st Canadian Infantry Division. Three brigades, nine regiments in all, but we're going to try to cover a six-day battle in one go. And you'd lose the will to live, and I would quite literally lose the plot. So I'm not going to get into the minutiae of, of who advanced where, step by step. But suffice it to say that if we think about the Germans as just being Germans, and if we quantify what the Canadians by saying um, that against those experienced paratroopers, we've got the Seaforth Highlanders, the Loyal Edmonton Regiment, known as the Eddies. Um, they're supported by the 12th Canadian Armoured Regiment. Um, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. Let, let's, yeah, the, the, the Eddies and the Seaforths. And then outside the town, um, in reserve, we've got the Carlton, the York, the West Nova Scotia, and the Hastings and Princess Edward, the Hasty Peas. Everyone knows the fight is coming. The Canadians and the Germans, it's all going to come down to who comes out on top in Ortona. But the Germans know the Canadians are there, and they've dug in. The Germans have been there for a while, haven't they? Yes, yeah, they have, yeah. Were the Canadians ready for all of this? Not exactly. Um, they've, they've been through the mill by now. As you know, Italy's what you might call undulating at the best of times, and the, the roads are pretty poorly connected. You need a donkey, some decent boots, and a demijohn and local hooch to keep you going. Um, it, it's hard work. It's been hard work. They've travelled uh, 750 kilometres in 63 days. 
They did some training in Britain. They've come come down through the Med to Sicily. They've done battle there, and they've everybody started working their way up. You've got the the Americans are taking the west flank. The British, the Allies are taking the east flank. The Canadians are kind of coming up the center. Everybody's shattered, and there, there's a reason they're shattered above and beyond. And it's not just the fact they've got a long way to go, and it's the geography is fairly hard work. But it's the fact that as they approach the winter line, the winter weather goes nuts. The snow turns to sleet. Melting snow means rivers rising, mud in the blood and the beard. That means it's hard slog, particularly for any armoured gear they're trying to bring with them. By, let me see, uh, late November, 23rd of November, they reach the River Sangro and they cross that. This is the, to the south of Ortona. This isn't easy, but to get to Ortona, um, the, the troops need to take two things. They need to take something called the Morrow River, four miles to the south, and the gully next to it. So in broad terms, the, the Germans are holding off the Canadians as they try to cross six kilometres of river valley. And this is valley that's strewn with landmines, enemy machine gun positions, there's artillery, knocked out bridges they're having to rebuild overnight, ravines. Montgomery gets the Canadian 1st Infantry to tackle this because the British 78, who are that, not that far away, they are exhausted. So the Canadians are not exactly ready for a turn. They are absolutely shattered even by the time they get here. However, Montgomery, in, in his infinite wisdom, um, he kind of sees the Canadians as a bit expendable. It's a, it's a bit sort of, you know, a way for those bloody Canadian troops to rally around and take control. And what he, what he fails to consider is the fact that in all this rain and the mud, this is more than hard work. The tank's heavy equipment is really bogged down. There are delays. It, it's just mental. However, they get to the Morrow River. They go across, they cross the Morrow River forward. It, it's four days and four nights of mental battle. You've got men who'd seen combat in Africa fighting on the German side. You've got heavy losses on both sides. It's constant fire. And, and particularly the crossing of the Morrow River, that wins praise from the Fuhrer himself. He, he says that the, the 26th and the 90th Panzers, they were stubborn and reckless in defence of a situation that was almost impossible to overcome. So the Canadians have really laid into it. They take the gully. This is the, the, the kind of the ravine just outside Ortona. They've been told that Ortona is so important in terms of they can see the end of the year coming, the weather's getting worse, they just want to get there, get in, get sorted. Montgomery wants to set up his headquarters there so that they're all out just putting their last reserve of strength in. Vokes, Chris Vokes asks for a couple of um, creeping barrages to be set down just in front of the troops. This is when you lay, lay like shells down, a progressive wall of bursting high explosives and the troops move forward behind it. The first barrage, which is referred to as morning glory, is no cocker. The second barrage, orange blossom, is not quite so careful. It's not quite so clever. They're using old maps, and I could talk to you about maps in the Second World War for ages, but suffice it to say that the maps were so bad, um, the ones being used to organise and orchestrate that, that second barrage, that it didn't go to plan. There was what you might call a depletion of Canadian forces. But it went by the book, and that's not surprising when you know a bit about Chris Vokes. He wanted, um, he saw these two barrages going badly. He knew the troops were, were basically on their last legs, um, but he, he, he knew that he had to get Ortona. He wanted a new strategy. He wanted to send different troops in. But still, Montgomery, believing that Canadians were expendable, said, no, you are going to get this done. So Vokes takes nine days, start to finish, getting to the edge of Ortona. His, his men called him the butcher, and it was not without some sort of affection because it was just they were racing into fire. Montgomery sent the message up. Um, what is taking your troops so long to reach Ortona? And Vokes sent the reply back, well, tell the old bugger to come up and have a look for himself. Literally verbatim, that's the message that, that, that went back. He was very much a by-the-book soldier, called it as it was. Um, it, but his troops, his commanding officers would really, to some extent, and I know it's a terrible word to use, but they were inspired to actually give it their all for Vokes. He cared about the troops. 
um, one of his claims to fame is that uh, the previous year, um, or uh, earlier, I should say, he had been responsible for trying to set up a brothel for his troops' benefit. He was a great believer in the fact that troops only cared about two things if they're, if they're facing mortal combat the next day. They care about getting drunk and they care about getting laid. Definitely. So he, yeah, he sent his Batman off with a, a pocket full of lira and told them to go and find a decent madam, some half-clean girls, um, box prophylactics and get the boys sorted in the aspiration that he would reduce the levels of ED. The, um, and it wasn't exactly what you'd call successful. The, um, the, the message came back from, from 8th High Command. There will be no brothels. No brothels, period. There will be no brothels of any kind operating anywhere in the 8th Army. Um, <laughs> Love but, your Monty impression. <laughs> but folks, he's, he's fairly committed to doing the best he can for his men by the book. He's also a believer in his leadership style. He inspires his troop commanders to move forward with a simple direction. Here's your objective. Go and get it done. Now it's down to you. I will back you with, with what you're going to go and do. So as they have crossed the Morrow River, as they come across the gully, he's sent a third of the nine regiments. Three, I mean, he sent a third of his troops up the west flank of Ortona. Um, and he sends two thirds into town believing that, according to doctrine, the fighting is now done. According to by-the-book doctrine, the Germans will have retreated to higher ground. He's knocked the panzers out. He's crossed the mark. He's pushed them back. He's created carnage and mayhem. Good for him. The Germans are going to retreat. It's standard German practice to withdraw to more easily defensible terrain of which there's a great deal just to the north of Ortona. It gets quite high up there. And urban combat is not prevailing doctrine for for anybody at this point. The Germans, to to their their great chagrin, have have developed a complete antipathy for urban combat following what happened in Stalingrad. Um, The Germans were expected to cut and run up the only route out of Ortona, Highway 16. That's what Vokes believes, and that's the message he sent forward. I know you're on your last legs. I know you want this all to be over as quickly as possible, but go into Ortona and just clear it up. But the but, Germans play dirty, don't they? Yeah, they do. They do a bit. You could put it like that. They, the Germans have, again, seen the writing on the wall. They've seen this relentless advance of, of Canadians who've got the, the you know, whites of their eyes. They just, they're fed up. They've had more than enough time to prepare. They've pulled back from the morrow. They've pulled back from the gully. And the worst, worst of this is the Canadians assume there won't be much fighting. But, the Cana- but, but what they don't know is that the Germans have been very busy. The, the Canadians assume that they're going to walk into town and it's, going to be, it's not going to be a, a, you know, a party, but that they will just clear up stragglers. 20th of December, they get off to quite a slow start. This is their belief. They approach the town. They, they go forward on two fronts. There's the Eddies under a guy called Major Jim Stone. Um, they're supported by the Three Rivers Tank Regiment. And then the, you have the Seaforth Highlanders under a guy, um, you're not going to believe this, his name is John McLean, as in diehard John McLean. As in- <laughs> I love it. You can't, if, if you, could, you couldn't make this up. If you, if you could, you'd have to invent it. Well, they you would walk, need Alan Rickman then as the German would, general, wouldn't yeah, you? Yeah, my, my Alan and Rickman impression isn't so hard. Mr. But, Mr. But, Mr. Crazy. <laughs> but on, on, the, on the move into town, they, they cross open ground without too much trouble. They go up a ditch. They take out a machine gun nest. Things aren't looking too bad. They take um, the Santa Maria Constantinople Church. It's a bit chaotic, but it's all right. They're moving forward. They've got the Three Rivers Shermans are on the edge of town, just outside a place called Piazza Victoria. And they discover two things. They discover that the Germans have been busy, and they discover that the Germans have not retreated to higher ground. Oh, bother, said Pooh. The intel then... First thing in the morning, they send some guys out and who come back and say, look, actually, what we're facing here is not stragglers left in the town. We've still got two full battalions of Fallschirmjäger, fresh troops. These guys have uniforms that don't look dirty. Three power, four power, 
Um, and um, the Canadian Stone McLean, they know that the, the Fallschirm Jäger is sitting underneath a guy called General Richard Heydrich, who is more than experienced. And what the Germans have done is they have basically gathered every Schmeisser, Carabiner, MP7, Panzerschreck, and they have blown up the buildings. Medieval granite, four foot thick. They've created rubble piles in the narrow streets that are 10, 20 feet high. They've infested them with anti-tank mines and anti-tank mines, anti-personnel mines. And essentially, if you remember, I said it's like Milton Keynes. They've blocked the side streets. What they want the Canadians to do, they want to funnel the Canadians into town, right the way across town to a specific large piazza where you can guess they've got um, machine guns and snipers set up all the way. They want to do a number on the Canadians and take them out. Now, do you know what this reminds me of? Yeah. Don't, don't judge me. I really don't care. But you know that scene in Save It Private Ryan? Yeah. Where they're sitting up there with a the sniper in the tower. Yeah. And it's the, they're, they're just picking them off one by one. I think there's a similar scene in, in Downfall as well, where the guy jumps from, it might be Downfall, might not be Downfall, somebody will correct me, where the guy jumps from one building to the next and the sniper's been waiting for hours and just picks him off. Oh, no, that's um, the, the Russian one. Why has my mind gone blank to that? Um, Enemy Jude at the Gates. Jude Law's in it? Jude Law, Jude Law's. How can you forget a film with Jude Law in it? En- Enemy at the Gates, that's the one. That's the one, that's the one. Snipers are doing good. Snipers are on the menu today. Now, what, what we have to remember is that Urban combat is a no-no. When we think about the home guard, even dad's army, practicing fighting on a village green, even they've agreed that, you know, they're giving it a good run fighting around the village hall. Actually, fighting in built up areas is a no-no. Nobody wants a showdown in a town, particularly because, specifically because snipers are what you're going to walk into. Doctrine on both sides is limited counter-attack when you come up against a formidable defensive position in an urban situation. Hold on if you can, but only clear it if you're going to lose less than you're going to gain. The Germans want to channel the Canadians down the main road. The Canadians know that this is going to have to involve fighting in the streets. So what happens is Jim Stone, on the morning of the 21st, he decides that, well... That's what they would like us to do. So what they're going to be expecting us to do is something else. So I tell you what, we'll do what they're least expecting. First thing on the 21st, he gets some Shermans, he lines them up, gets them put into low gear, sirens blazing, and with as much noise and kerfuffle as he makes 300 yards down the main drag through Ortona. This is the the least, this is exactly what the Germans weren't expecting to happen. They did not expect the Canadians to go, right, you want to fight? We'll pick a fight. The Canadians knock out an, an anti-tank position at the end of that main drag, Vittorio Emmanuel. Um, they, they try to do it with a piet, but the guy gets knocked down. They do it with stone fragmentation gren- grenades instead. Um, they can't call in air support. The... It, it's really important to remember that when you've got a town that's falling around, round your ears, the mud, it's no longer about mud and blood. It's about dust and acrid smoke. Uh, it's choking you, collapsing homes. You've got buildings falling everywhere. It's acrid. And it's it's hard work. It really is hard work when your men are trying to clamber over rubble in which a machine gun nest has been hidden. It's hard work when your men are trying to move forward and under every brick and plank, there's an an anti-personnel mine has been buried. The Germans have been busy. That said, the powers, they've been busy, but they've been busy. It it just pales into insignificance, the amount of effort they had to put in. They're holding this town with less than 100 men because they've been busy. They've been able to control the flow of the battle. And at this point, Kesselring sends a message down to Heydrich and he says, look, I know you lost the Morrow and I know you lost the Gully, but really, you you kind of got to hang on to Ortona. So these powers know that they're in, in for the long run. The Canadians, 20, 20th and the 21st, they're fighting really hard. They're sending um, artillery, they're sending tanks in. Come the 22nd, the Seaforth start, start working out that 
this full frontal isn't going to completely work. So they got the left flank of the town. They're trying to avoid snipers on the crossroads. And this is where both the Seaforth and the Eddies, independently of each other, at platoon level, they come up with an approach to making progress that is now considered as being their invention. However, the Home Guard probably invented it first. It is documented first. And it's called mouse holing. Mouse holing involves when you've got a, a long row of buildings and you want to go from one end to the other of the long row of buildings and you know there are snipers all the way, what you do is you look at the buildings and go, well, I can't go down this side. I can't go down that side. I know I'll go through the building. The Canadians have um, picked up along the way some anti-tank telemines. They've got plenty of Hawkins grenades. Um, they've, they've got they, these pressure de detonated anti-tank mines can be attached to a wooden stick rigged together with primer cord and safety fuses. And they create beehive shaped charges, plastic explosives. And what they do is they go in through the end of like a terrace of these buildings. They go in on the ground floor. The Germans on the other side of that end of the wall haven't seen what's coming. So you're going to knock some guys out there. The dust settles, you go up three or four floors, you go through the top floor into the next building. You're then fighting down on Germans who aren't expecting you. And by the way, they're all a bit stunned now. You go through the bottom into the next building and then up and you carry on. The, the charges could be detonated simultaneously. They're using six pounders as well. I mean, these guys, these boys have lugged these six pounders in and onto window sills, and they've they they have just used every asset and every resource they've got to start blowing holes from building to building to building. In the meantime, the Germans are actually knocking down more buildings, trying to create a, almost like a diversion. But the, the, the Canadians are making progress with this approach and they, they're doing so and they're learning as they go. And sometimes they're learning to their cost. There's, um, there's one youngster who goes into a house and he points at a, a Fallschirmjäger, like kind of um, short knife that's sitting on a windowsill, sitting in a window box. Great souvenir. One of the veterans comes along and says, you might not want to touch that. And when he's asked why, the, the youngster sort of says, well, looks like a great souvenir to me. And the veteran sort of says, well, yes, but, and he picks it and throws it out of the window, moves back in the same process, in, uh, you know, the same moment. And the um, knife has been, a t yeah, you're yeah. Right. <laughs> the knife has been attached to the, the, the rig on the knife. The Germans were playing dirty. It's clever though, I've got to say. It is. It's not nice, but it's clever. Um, the, the, the Canadian boys start to learn what to look for. They start not to walk on the convenient plank across the rubble pile because there's going to be a tank, there's going to be an anti personnel mine underneath it. They start not to pick up these souvenirs. And mouse holing continues, continues at pace. They get to, by virtue of the way that they're doing this, um, they get to um, Piazza Municipale. They hook up, uh, the Eddies hook up with the Sea Force. And, and you have to remember that by this time, tank progress has slowed for the Canadians because of the amount of rubble there is in the streets. The Germans didn't need tanks. They had um, dominated the rooftops with sniper fire. The, the Canadians are bringing up um, six pounds to try and blow this rubble out of the way. But by this point, I mean, the, the Three Rivers only lost three Sherman tanks in the fighting, but that's because they were trying to use them as almost mobile pillboxes and to transport ammo and mortars forward and to evacuate the wounded. They, were, they became more of um, an operational resource in terms of supporting the infantry, the men on the ground, than they did in, in terms of providing cover. Um, the, the, the sniper fire, though, was incredible. To step into the street in Ortona was generally regarded as suicide among the Canadians. Um, the the eddies had dug dug in two six pounders by this time, firing up another one of the main drags, Corso and Berto, to try and take buildings out faster. Uh, there's a there's a great story about um, a guy called Eddie Boyd. He was running those guns, both guns, trying to provide a, a sort of a counter barrage of mortars and artillery fire, and he was absolutely shocked to see Private Howard Mabley, who in England in training 
let's say that Mabley had been, shall we say, reticent to engage with the whole war thing. He was a Canadian farmer from Alberta. And Boyd had kind of made it his mission to teach Mabley how to fire an anti-tank gun. Load, aim, fire. Load, aim, fire. And Mabley could not get it. There's always one. He's, he's the youngster, you know, with the, the piece of straw hanging out of his mouth and the one wobbly eye. He, he was just, he should not have been there. But when he was, when it came to it, Boyd came down to see those six pounders firing up Corso Umberto. And Mabley had made it his mission to load that gun. He put 800 rounds through that gun, 15 to 20 rounds as quickly as possible. Then he'd run back, get more. Every one of the 800 rounds was loaded by Mabley. And he, he, he was deafened in the process on that day. Um, the, the commitment from the Canadians was incredible. They knew what they were walking into as they tried to run across Ortona. The Germans have got, um, the Germans have got Panzerschrecks, uh, the Offenruhr stovepipe, the, the anti, 88 mil anti-tank rocket launchers. They were firing these above the heads of the Canadians, um, to, to get them to duck in or out so that the snipers could pick them off. They didn't need the tanks. It was relentless. This, this idea of um, simple warfare, Army A tackles Army B, I think we often forget just how chaotic it, it can become. Um, one of the things that um, I guess is important for Auto, and the reason we know so much about it, is that the Canadian Broadcasting Company was there at the time. And a guy called Matthew Holton, um, he was a renowned war correspondent. I think he wrote, it, it wasn't hell, it was the courtyard of hell. The rattling of machine guns never stopped. The men don't want to be relieved after seven days and seven nights. But the battlefield is an appalling thing to see. It's a maelstrom of noise and hot splitting steel. The, the, the great thing about the, the, the CBC being there is that there's, there's loads of video footage of Ortona that you can check out on YouTube. Um, and, and when you see this footage, you will see the Canadians. You won't see the Germans because they're hiding. And the other things that you rarely see, I think there's only a few seconds of it, is the Italians. We, we also forget that when we talk about the Canadians and Germans, this town had a population of about nine and a half thousand. And at this point, there are only about 1,000, 1,200 people left. But those people, the, the, the residents of the town, have hunkered down. They have decided... They'd heard on, you know, that they'd heard that the Americans were coming and the, it was all going to be great and armistice. So they'd stayed in the town. So the Canadians are, are falling over themselves to move forward, but they're also falling over, quite literally falling over Italians who are sticking their heads out going, what the heck's going on? Um, as, as they move across Ortona, um, there, there are some interesting stories about the, the way that the, the troops were committed to rescuing so many of those civilians. And as as the boys sort of cycled in and out on rest breaks, they would take the civilians back out of the town. Um, the, there's, it, it's straight in and it's straight out. These roads are horizontal and vertical. It's not difficult to navigate your way around Ortona, even if you've got a, a dumpy Italian grandma on your back. There's, um, there's, a, there's a place called Dead Horse Square. It, it's named that for a reason. There's a dead horse lying there. They navigate by talking about go down there and turn left at Tank Lady. Tank Lady, unfortunately, happens to be um, an old Italian woman who came out of her house at exactly the wrong moment. Um, and unfortunately, while, you know, you do your best to avoid mad Italian women running into the street, the tank didn't manage to miss her. So there she was laying in the street. The, the Canadians would try and move the children that stuck their heads out to find out what well, children are curious um, that for them, war isn't black and white. And there, there are stories about the, the Canadian boys passing children back over dead soldiers to try and get them out of town. This is, this is a town in which two worlds really do collide. Germans and allies have the same stories that are being lost um, in terms of how human conflict can be and how human a battle can be. Um, it, it's also, I mean... That, that, I guess, leads us on to the fact that this is Christmas, 24th, yeah. 24th of December. The, the Allies and the Germans have got difficult choices. We've got Christmas coming up. Um, the, on, the, on the 24th, for example, the Canadians, they're, they're not stupid. They do want to keep 
morale up. The guys are coming in and out of the town. They're issued with a man-sized, um, you know, mug of rum with tea in it, which tastes like Moro River. Morrow River mud as a chaser, that, that was it. That was the description. And what they're hoping now is that the Germans will withdraw. They're making serious progress. Unfortunately, what happens is Heydrich sends more troops into town. He also sends out a brigade to, to try and see the Canadians who are now, it's clear, working their way up the western flank. Um, but the, the Edmonton War Diary notes this, uh, uh, this sort of strengthening from the Germans, even though they're being pushed back, even though the Canadians are making progress. Um, that the house to fight, house fighting is going on. Um, you've got artillery shells going up the coast road, but the, the, the Germans are sending reinforcements in. Tank progress has slowed to, to almost a, a complete stop. It's infantry. Um, they're making, they, they come um, onto the school, they find hundreds of civilians inside. There's almost like it's not a truce, but there's a lull in the, in the battle while almost both sides turn around and say, do you know what, just, just get those civilians out of there. While there's a lull in this then, did the Germans, what is the comprehension of blowing up the whole town? Did they need to go full scale on it, bearing in mind the civilian presence? Um, because it doesn't end up working, does it? So what was the justification or was was there none? Was there just, this is how we stop them, we're going to blow up this entire medieval town? Yeah, um, yes yes, and no. The plan from the Germans' perspective was, this is a granite town. Um, it's difficult to fight here, let alone um, it, as, as we've retreated from Mora and the gully, things aren't looking great. We're hearing word on the wire that actually things are looking really bad because the wood line's been breached in several places now. So what can we do? Well, let's use what we've got. Let's blow it up. The, the cathedral is, there's a great shot. Um, it's been immortalised in paintings. There's a, a war artist here as well. Um, is the, the cupola is torn in half. They just decide to make the best of what they've got. And the best thing they, they can do from their perspective, is make it as hard as damn possible for the Canadians to advance. And that's what they did. Um, it's, it's an interesting approach because the, the information they were getting wasn't necessarily the, the, the actual situation on the ground. Um, but, but that said, they, they were where they were. I mean, Christmas Day, Germans and Allies alike it's quite strange how, how some things in culture seem to seep into our consciousness no matter what else is going on. Yes, you're, you're sitting in the middle of a town and the Germans are blowing it up and, and you, your best mate's had his head blown off by a sniper. But it's Christmas. It's the 20th of December. The Second World War didn't take a holiday. You've got Canadians and Americans at home and abroad who, who all did their best to celebrate it. And the Germans did too. Um, the, the army and the fleet post offices did their best to, to actually get presents down to the troops. So obviously some didn't arrive on time. Families were advised to mail Christmas packages from September onwards. Yeah. And many servicemen, um, received those packages later on, but, but the gifts were just a huge morale booster. I mean, some gifts were a bit mad. You know, there, there are stories about neckties and, and aftershave being sent. <laughs> And who doesn't love socks at Christmas? But, you know... Facts would have been uh, yeah. more appreciated, right? That's cigarettes yeah. for the Americans. Yeah, but, but even on the front lines, the, the kitchens tried to provide a Christmas respite. I mean, in 42, um, over in Guadalcanal, talk to me about Guadalcanal someday, that the troops were, were happy to just get an orange and warm beer. Now, here in Ortona, um, one of the reasons that Ortona's, I guess, known in terms of being an unknown battle, is that there are some photographs of long rows of tables with white tablecloths and a bottle of beer for every Canadian, candies, you know, sweetmeats, cigarettes, nuts, oranges, apples, everything that the, the, court, the boys have been scrounging for the last couple of weeks as they've worked their way through the Italian countryside, chocolate bars, and the officers served the men the companies ate in relays. Men would go into town via whatever safe route had been had been sort of cleared for them and come back out again. And they had a menu that included pork with apple sauce, cauliflower, vegetables, 
Um, Christmas pudding. There is there is um, Canadian broadcast com- company footage of a Christmas pudding. Some of the guys died on their way to and from the from the church in which this Christmas pudding was held because they got drunk. This was a great idea, but not the best idea in the world that you know the Canadian officers have ever had. In terms of morale, though, dear heaven, what a thing to do! And that approach to morale for troops is universal. On the German side of things, the the paratroopers, when they weren't manning a machine gun nest or sitting on top of a roof, you know, with a sniper rifle, they too were cycling, not literally cycling, but they were going back to um, a railway tunnel just to the north of Ortona, where they were relatively well in, well entrenched. And they, for Christmas dinner, they had sausages and potatoes and vegetables, and they had bread. They too had been scrounging on the way down. Um, in, in terms of a reflection of the battle itself and how much it meant, this is a real breath of fresh air for everybody involved. The, 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 on the Canadian side, they're getting really frustrated because they've made a lot of progress. Decisions have been made at platoon level to make this progress. And clearly the strategy of, of just walking to Ortona and take it was somewhat flawed. But that said, it looks like the end in sight. By the time we get to the 26th, what the Canadians don't know is that the day after Christmas Day, Kesselring sends word down to Heydrich to perform a fighting withdrawal. He orders the Germans to stick it, but not stick it at all costs. Hitler's original um, missive a few days previously was quite literally hold or tone at all costs. However, with the way things have gone, that's just not going to work now. So 27th, 28th, um, on, on the 27th, wow, there was um, the, an Edmonton officer and I think 22, 23 of his men were distributing ammunition to clear the remaining Germans. They were blown up by a, up a prepared booby trap and the retaliation was phenomenal because there's, there's a kind of understanding in urban conflict. You know where you've seen some, um, uh, you know, your, your enemy's position. You, you actually make a calculated decision what order to try and take them out in. But when um, Stone and McLean realised that they'd lost 23 men in one blow, they organised, um, they, they blew up a building in which there were two German platoons. Um, it, it wasn't pretty. End of the 28th, this is two days after Boxing Day, you, what few Germans are left that haven't started performing the, the, um, the fighting withdrawal, they're trapped between the cathedral in Ortona and the castle. It, it sounds strange to have a small town like this have a cathedral and a castle, but though they are ubiquitous in, in Italian towns. Religion, you will have the, the, the medieval defences, you'll have um, several churches possibly. Um, by this point, there's not much of those, those edifices left and the Germans are trapped between them. The Allies have, we've now got warships um, sort of hoving to just off the coast, and at dark, on the 28th, a communication arrives at the last German command post, um, which is a warehouse just to the north of Ortona, and the guys are are ordered to to save what's left of the battalions that are, are still alive. The warnings had gone from the Canadians, the messages had gone over that, look, our warships are sitting off the coast and if you're not careful what we're going to do is we're going to carry out a complete car- carpet bombardment we're knackered we've had enough just go away just if you don't we're going to blow you all up and that's what happened the um the message went across and plans were put into place to um to to i won't use the word decimate because that means one tenth not one hundredth but to absolutely just ravage the town from the sea and what happens is that the Canadians wake up and what they realise is that rather than brace for this um, barrage of of mortar fire the town is quiet because the Germans have run away they have seen the light Um, they've got as far as Piazza San Tommaso in the old town which is a few metres from the castle and they're literally looking up and the birds have started to sing the Germans have performed a complete withdrawal. They have gone, it's done, it's over. So how do we know all of this happened? Well, 
from the German perspective, we have the, the diary of a young trooper, 17 years old, and 17 is too young for anyone to be um, in a war. Falsham uh, Jäger diary, his, his name was Karl Bayerleiniger, and he's the guy who actually noted what the Germans had for their Christmas dinner. From the Canadian's perspective, we had Canadian Broadcasting Company on the ground. Um, correspondent Matthew Holton, he's well known, and another guy called Milton Bracker. These guys were wiring information back to the New York Times and other um, broadsheets in Canada and in America. And I guess this, this is quite pertinent because when the missives went back, when the, the explanations of how well or badly the Canadians were, were doing went back, one of the things that Bracker wrote was, for some reason, the Canadians are trying to stage a mini Stalingrad. And what what my my theory is, and, I, and this isn't even theory, that sitting on Hitler's desk is a copy of the papers. One of the reasons he he says hold on to Ortona at all costs is because he's being reminded by the mainstream Canadian and American media that this is looking like a mini Stalingrad, and he has not stopped feeling the pain of Stalingrad. I mean, the scale of fighting is nowhere near near as large, but it's every bit as vicious, and it's very reminiscent. Some of the, the paratroopers trying to stay in possession of Ortona will have been at Stalingrad. This is just too close to the bone. And in fact, what um, Kesselring says is that we, we didn't want to defend Ortona decisively, but the English, the Canadians, made it as important as Rome. And you can't do anything when things get that bad. If they make it that important and the world press makes so much of it, we have to hang on to it. So in terms of the prestige involved in losing Ortona, Hitler decreed that there, there would be no retreat. Fortunately, though, the Canadians did take Ortona, and I'll try and get the figures right. I may confuse ranks and regiments, but I do try and get these ones right. The, the Canadian War Cemetery just outside Ortona holds the grave of 1,375 Canadians who were killed there. but that said, the Germans did perform the the the, the um, fight of withdrawal, and the Canadians lived to fight another day. Marin, thank you so much for joining us and giving us this incredibly detailed account of the battle for Tone. I mean, that was absolutely fantastic. I really, really enjoyed that. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Join us on Monday when Becky Brown will be with us to talk all about her brand new book, which is about the Blitz spirit. We, this can be really interesting because we did something with Josh Levine on this right at the very beginning in week one of History Hack. And I am quite interested to see how the Blitz spirit now, many years it feels like later, matches up with what's going on in the land of COVID. So it should be really good. So don't miss that. Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Alina and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join us on either of those platforms uh, marcus is currently working on some benefits for you so uh, there's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms we're revamping ourselves on both of them so don't forget to go in you can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up history hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year we are now on YouTube. We are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms. So you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time. So do go over there and subscribe.